Hello, everybody. Professor Barth is here. History professor at Arizona State University. It's my pleasure to continue onward with this class. And today we are in lecture four. Part A, we're going to look at cowrie currency. We'll also take a look at ancient Bronze Age India and China, going into the Iron Age in, in China's case. Part B, we'll look at the dawn of coinage in ancient Greece. And part C, we'll look at the spread of coinage to Persia, India, and China. So let's begin with the cowrie shell. Now, in the history of money, there are a few items that are more important than the cowrie shell, just from a world history perspective. Now, cowrie was a small to large, it could be small, medium, or large size uh, sea snail. And, but most oftentimes when you hear the word cowrie, it's referring to the shell of the snail. By the way, you'll sometimes hear it spelled with, or sometimes see it spelled with a Y instead of IE. I'm using the IE here. But the, the shell, as you see from the photograph, is uh, uh, quite pleasing to look at, pleasing to handle, very uh, smooth. It has a almost semi-translucent appearance. It's shaped like an egg, but on the underside, it is flat. And it has a, on the underside, it has a, a narrow opening. And the opening is bordered by a toothed edge. Like I said, uh, pleasing to look at. Oftentimes used in, uh, historically, to the present day, in jewelry. And in fact, actually, the word that for porcelain actually uh, uh, derives from the old Italian word for cowrie shell. The, the, uh, the Italians called the cowrie shell porcelana. And so they gave the word uh, porcelain because of the, the similarities and the, the smooth appearance, uh, again, the semi-translucent appearance and shine of the object. Now, in the ancient world, the major, most important source for cowrie shells were the Maldives. And the Maldives are a collection of about 1,000 coral islands just southwest of the Indian subcontinent. And tradesmen obtained cowrie shells because they mined cowrie shells elsewhere, especially in the Indian Ocean. But the Maldives were, bar none, the most important source so that uh, the Arabs actually nicknamed the Maldives the Money Isles, the Money Isles. And actually to this day, the central bank for the Maldives, the Maldives Monetary Authority has a uh, picture of a cowrie shell. Cowrie shells were measured in bags or bushels. And that is, that is how they circulated. Sometimes they were a subsidiary currency if gold and silver was available, especially if, if, if you're talking about the Middle East and Northwest India where there, there was more gold and silver in circulation, then it, then cowries would have functioned as a subsidiary currency or as a secondary currency. But in other places, it, it functioned as the primary currency. But cowrie shells circulated for hundreds, even thousands of miles coast of India, Southeast Asia, around the Arabian Sea, the coast of East Africa. Cowrie shells appeared in West Africa, in ancient China. As we'll see, there was uh, considerable use of the cowrie shell. Now, cowries are imperfect as money, of course. They uh, are not as portable. You required more of them, somewhat like copper, to complete a transaction. Probably one of the major hindrances is that they are not homogeneous, meaning they're different. Some cowrie shells are better than others. There's, there are different grades and quality, which you know could create some issues. If you're, if you're paying, making a large payment with a bushel of cowrie shells, the merchant's gonna have to sift through them and, and judge whether or not these are good shells. And so there's a, um, cowrie shells are heterogeneous. Uh, obviously, they are also not fusible or uh, divisible in the same way that metals are. And so, and, and of course, you can't stamp them. That being said, 
very durable. They have undeniable intrinsic value. Again, beautiful to look at. People want them and they can, they can travel very, very long distances. So all things considered, I think history has proved that the cow Rochelle is one of the better commodity monies. Cow Rochelle was used in the Indus Valley civilization. The Indus Valley civilization is one of the great early civilizations in ancient Bronze Age or Bronze Era human history. And the Indus Valley civilization, of course, was centered along the Indus River Basin in northwest, the northwest part of the Indian subcontinent. So today is Northwest India, but also Pakistan, uh, parts of Pakistan at least, and parts of, Af of Afghanistan. The uh, Probably the invention of wheeled transport took place in this region of the world, and uh, they had far-flung trade, thanks to uh, cattle-drawn carts, to uh, boats and other nautical um, technology, trade with Mesopotamia, and also trade in the Arabian Sea and, and ultimately in the Indian Ocean. Well, the currency in this civilization, there was uh, some gold. In fact, there were a few gold mines in Northwest India. There will be further gold discoveries in, in Northwest India shortly. But the primary currency were cowrie shells and fish hooks among the more common people because of the centrality of the river systems to this area and, and the importance of, of river transport. So ancient Indian currency, cowrie shells, fish hooks, and, there were, and gold and silver did appear in uh, larger transactions. Here's some ancient Indian gold, jewelry, ornaments, pendants, beads, what have you. Cowrie shells were also used in ancient Bronze Age China. Now, before the Zhu dynasty, there was a dynasty called the Shang dynasty that lasted for almost uh, six centuries. And the Shang dynasty was the first that we know of to make use of the cowrie shell. The cowrie shell continues into the Iron Age in China. And in fact, actually the classical Chinese character for money is a stylized drawing of the cowrie shell. And if you look at the traditional Chinese character for words like goods or buy or sell, those also, those classical characters contain a pictograph for the cowrie shell. And so cowrie shell played a major role. Uh, including into this Zhu dynasty. The Zhu dynasty actually was the longest running dynasty in Chinese history. Although for the, the second half of it, power was not really centralized and, and power was located in a number of different independent provinces within the dynasty. But under the Zhu dynasty, expansion in, in copper mining, tin mining, lead, uh, there was some gold in ancient China and so we see some, some ancient Chinese gold, including, including use in personal items and use as a barter item. But for one reason or another, um, the Chinese elite, elite actually did not, uh, were not all as much attracted to gold as other civilizations. They, def they put definite value on it. They saw gold as, as beautiful before the Chinese imperial court in this period. Oh, here's a, jumped ahead of myself a little bit. This is a gold belt from the uh, era of the Han dynasty, which came after the, the Zhu dynasty. This is a Han dynasty era gold belt. So there's undoubted value in, in beauty attached to gold in, in ancient Chinese culture. But actually jade was what the Chinese elites really um, sought after. Um, Jade, very, very beautiful mineral. Um, and also, if you look at ancient Chinese art, jade plays a central central part. And actually, even to the present day, 
in in 21st century China, jade is highly valued, and actually a lot of Chinese middle class families have have used jade as a store of wealth because of the just again the the uh, a cultural affinity for jade, and it's indeed you look at jade, it's very very beautiful mineral. Uh, the problem with using jade for currency, and this is why jade did not take off as currency in ancient China, is essentially a, a rock. Uh, it belongs to the rock category of, of minerals, and and so uh, you can't. Uh, well, you can shape it and you can sculpt it, and it's undoubtedly very beautiful to look at. Uh, you cannot uh, melt it like a metal. You can't melt it down and and form a a coin or or any, uh, uh, you can't work it like metals. And so that instantly puts it at a, at a disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis, um, copper, which as we'll see in part C today, the Chinese latch onto. So when a Ch Chinese arrive at coinage, which will be in the fourth century BC, they don't use jade coins because that, that wouldn't be doable. They, they latch onto copper. Um, but nonetheless, this is, I think this is one reason why gold doesn't really quite take off in the same way that it does in Mesopotamia or Egypt or, uh, or um, other parts of the world, India, in ancient China. Um, ancient China was a very agricultural society. It was a feudal society where land was owned by lords and was farmed by peasants. And so besides the cowrie shell, the cowrie shell was used by the, the ancient Chinese in coastal areas, and the Chinese are, are beginning to uh, uh, involve themselves in some maritime trade. So coastal areas are using a cowrie shell. But if you go deep into the rural uh, feudal agricultural sectors of, the, of ancient China, they latch on to very interesting type of commodity money, um, spade money, farming tools that were made of a combination of different metals. and. Uh, Copper was um, the predominant metal used in this used in this type of money, but also alloyed with lead and tin. Well, at first it began as a barter item. Of farming tools, you need them, uh, and so it's pretty understandable. Again, go back to the old uh, to the first lecture where we talked about different theories of the origins of money. Th this money here lines up pretty well with that, right? It's uh, undoubtedly farming tools are very important. You can see how they would arise as a very naturally as a medium of exchange. But before too long, uh, the Chinese people began to use spades not only as money but as a sort of representative money, and and actually created spades that were actually uh, too flimsy for use as literal tools but rather represented farming tools and, and maintain, retain the old shape. And you look here, these are, this, these are undoubted money. Uh, different characters would be inscribed on the, on the spade and the characters would uh, indicate some, uh, a place name, possibly a number or a, a, the name of a clan. And again, these were about Rain and it, and it varied per region, but very uh, range from about fifty percent copper to maybe eighty percent copper, and and the rest would be lead and tin. And the idea was, it had it has intrinsic value because of those metals. But then, you could also, anytime you want, melt it down to create an actual spade. But isn't that interesting that they retain the shape? They did the same for knives, knives, and uh, knife money also took off in, in here too. It's about 50 to 70% copper, began as a literal just bartering item, became a medium of exchange, and then ultimately the Chinese created a, a sort of representative knife money that uh, that could be used and was used in in trade. So spade money and knife money, as we'll see, we'll see this in part C of this lecture. The Chinese are always, uh, in, in the history of money, always doing something a little different. Um, here we have the, uh, a very different type of commodity money in, in spade and knives. And in part C, you'll see a very different type of coin, a very different type of coin that we don't see elsewhere. And then uh, later this semester, we'll, we'll also see that the Chinese were the first to invent paper money. So ancient Chinese currency, there's the, the summation. So 
Thanks for tuning in. See you for part B. We will look at the rise of coinage in ancient Greece.